apologize for your patience. Sorry for all of the technical issues that we've been having. Um, if, uh, if you haven't ever joined us before, my name is Laylee. I'm the CEO of the Tahereh Justice Center. Um, the Tahereh Justice Center provides free legal defense for courageous women and girls who are fleeing human rights abuses. And we work with women who are from all over the world who face things like female genital mutilation, child marriage, domestic violence, um, and all kinds of violence that's reflective of the inequality of women and men throughout the world. Um, so what we do is we advocate legally and we work within the court system. Our job is fundamentally to make sure that the law is actually followed. Sometimes though, the courts themselves don't work. And when that doesn't work, we have to turn to other advocacy means. We turn to the media and we call on our friends like Penn to help us out and to help raise awareness about issues. So Penn Badgley is also with us. Um, Penn, as many of you know, is an actor, a musician, but also an advocate. And he had the chance to meet Vilma last Friday. So what we're gonna do is talk about Vilma's case, the issues in it. Uh, Penn is gonna share with us what it was like to meet her, and then we're gonna tell you what you can do to help. So thanks, Penn, for joining. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience traveling down to Atlanta? Uh, just the travel. <laughs> I know um, it was eventful. Getting in, why don't you tell us about getting yeah. into the detention facility, which is actually reflective of a lot of the problems that we have with our justice system in general, particularly the incarceration of people. Yeah, well, we weren't initially going to be let in, or I wasn't going to be let in because I wasn't an attorney. I'm still not an attorney. Um, I was with Shana Tabak, um, who is one of Vilma Carrillo's uh, legal representatives with the Tahereh Justice Center. And um, yeah, we were just flatly told upon entry, like just without any real, even like consulting of, of books or th and just like basically we were told that we, that we weren't gonna be allowed, that I couldn't see Vilma, that I couldn't meet Vilma. Um, Shana was certain that she had double and triple checked this because obviously like we drove hours to get there and um, you know, you guys are professionals. So, <laughs> so like it, it made sense to me that, that, that we were there at the correct time, but that um, we were just being sort of almost, what, what was surreal is that it felt arbitrary. It didn't, I mean, these people didn't know who I was. They didn't know that, nor did, would they have cared, I think, if they did. Um, but we were just being sort of arbitrarily obstructed, um, which I think points to, you know, I mean, consider, I, I think it's, inter it's significant to consider like the, the sort of uh, training that someone would have to receive in order to and behave that way. I don't think that's natural. I don't think that's naturally how these people would have behaved otherwise, you know? Yeah, I mean, we really commonly experience in the prisons. And I think when I called you and you very generously, like just the night before, flew out all the way from LA to Atlanta, drove one way over three hours to get to South Georgia from Atlanta to the prison, um, that sometimes we're linen and sometimes we're not. And the visiting hours were really clearly transparently on their website for the times that we showed up, that you showed up and they still wouldn't let you in. But um, according to Shana, who is with you, um, you used your charm, made some jokes, they Very. eventually <laughs> let you in, and then you got to meet Vilma, and you talked to yeah. her for quite a while. So can you share with us her story and what she told you? Well, I mean, so there's, our, our meeting was kind of, at some points it was sort of painful in how, impotent I felt be because like what might be clear I'm not sure but like so we didn't go down there thinking oh we're gonna get her out like that was not that was never the that's not how this works that was never the intention of this of this thing so so and you know I was speaking to her through uh through Shana who can speak fluent Spanish and and Vilma's own Spanish is not it's not her first language she speaks mom she's indigenous Guatemalan um uh, and this was apparently uh, a source of great difficulty uh, earlier when she was actually coerced into signing documents that she didn't understand. She didn't have an adequate translator. So her own case evidence and her um, application for legal asylum here, she wasn't able to make these things clear to the people trying her case. And it seemed pretty evident from what I understand of her story, it seems pretty evident that like 
this was understood by the by the authorities that like this was that she could have had a better translator or that she could have had more adequate translation that Spanish wasn't her first language. So this is yet again like total obstruction, um, unnecessary, inhumane. So anyway, um, you know, much of our conversation, I was just listening to to sort of what I I wanted to hear even just how she felt that day, you know, I wasn't sure which questions would be sensitive or not. You know, there's so much that you lose between languages or so much that you lose between cultures. I was really just listening. And like, sometimes she would smile, uh, a radiant smile that was quite disarming. And, you know, we'd, we'd actually be able to laugh, <laughs> like very much share in laughter, the three of us. And then there were points where she couldn't repress tears because the stories she was recounting were just like, you know, they're horrific. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, she 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 did say at one point um, very plainly to me that um, in the streets of her hometown she would see women shot in the head. So that points to you, just the culture she's coming from and the sort of gender-based violence she was facing. And then at home, obviously, she didn't tell me personally that day about the stuff she suffered at home because I knew the details and I you know it didn't seem appropriate to like to ask her about that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe um, for our viewers, I'll just briefly explain that yeah. she she is indigenous Guatemalan. She came, as many are doing, to flee violence in Guatemala. She walked across the border with her 11-year-old daughter with her. And obviously, as a mother, she was trying to protect not only herself, but her daughter. The domestic violence that she suffered was very extreme. She lost her four front teeth because of repeated punches to the face. And she was in a life-threatening situation and her own government, the gang violence and other conditions would have made it impossible for her to receive protection there. So again, like so many that are coming from our southern border, she traveled north with her daughter, but then when crossing the border was caught up in the political winds of the time under the quote unquote zero tolerance policy, which basically meant that every person who crosses the border would be criminally prosecuted. And in order to be criminally prosecuted, they needed to remain in prison. That meant then the forcible separation between uh, them and their children. And this, this was the legal guise under which the administration began to separate women and children. And they were horrifically, they were fraudulently separated. Mothers were told things like, um, we're going to take your child for a meal, and they would be taken and they would never see them again. And that's what happened. So her daughter, 11-year-old daughter was separated from her. She was incarcerated. She was then sent to Georgia. They crossed the border in Texas. Her daughter, in turn, was sent to Arizona to live with a foster family. Um, but she's one of those people coming here seeking asylum. Then the US courts, um, because of legal action of many organizations, including the Tahereh Justice Center, um, brought a class action lawsuit arguing that this was unconstitutional and uh, we all won. And as a result of that decision, all of the mothers, children, families were ordered reunited. And Penn, would you mind sharing what happened to her um, when that court decision came down and what she thought was going to happen? Uh, yeah, so Yezvi, Vilma's daughter, is a US citizen. This was discovered pretty quickly, but it wasn't understood initially. So. Um, she was born during a brief visit uh, when uh, Yezvi's parents, Vilma, and Yezvi's father was, uh, they, they were working here, as I understand, undocumented farm workers and in, in an oil, or, uh, oil, sorry, onion, um, mm -hmm. onion. Vidalia oh. onions in Vidalia, Georgia. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, it's interesting that she was working. She was actually a contributing member of society who, might, who wasn't able to receive any like reciprocity there you know it's like certainly not any health coverage or anything like that mm -hmm. um they returned to guatemala um to, uh, to, to help take care of Vilma's mother uh which is why they they did leave the country and then so upon returning here as we were saying once it was discovered that Yezvi was a u.s citizen um this court order this federal mandate uh as far as hopefully my language is correct here but um yeah. To, to reunite these families this, this summer, mm -hmm. uh, Yezvi was not considered eligible for this. Ye Yezvi and Vilma were not considered eligible because she's a U.S. citizen. So, mm -hmm. so in, in order at the federal level to reunite immigrant families, which, you know, the whole country was up in arms about, um, it's almost surreally hard to remember which thing we're up in arms about at this point. <laughs> um, but, uh, the, you know, now Vilma 
is 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 um continuing in her separation from Yezvi because Yezvi is an American citizen. So there's so again we're like up against what feels like arbitrarily cruel. Like for to 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 what end is Yezvi's and Vilma's separation affecting, supporting? Like what what is it that we're trying to accomplish through this separation of a mother and a daughter? Like you know, it really does beg questioning. It seems like a almost like a dumbly simple question to ask, but it needs to be asked because it, there is no clear answer here. You know, Vilma is not a criminal. Well, and, and in that case that you're describing that resulted in the decision that reunited um, others who don't have U.S. citizen children and they separated her from the application of that decision, um, they were really transparent, actually. Uh, the government was very transparent in the legal documents saying that the purpose for doing this was to deter people. And so it was a very explicit, we're going to basically make things as miserable, mm. as torturous, as horrific and heartbreaking as possible, so that word gets back and people don't come. But that was flawed. They were wrong. Um, and in fact, over the last 12 months, we've seen a 70% increase in the number of asylum seekers. And so this policy has not only not had an effect, but the numbers of people seeking protection have increased. And, and the logic is very clear. Um, when you are fleeing for your life, when you're fleeing for the protection of your child, nothing will deter you. No policy of cruelness, no words of don't come, nothing like that, because these are refugees. These are not, this is not an act of convenience to come over to the United States. It's not about working or having a better job. It's about saving their lives. It's about whether they will die or not. And when people, people's instincts for self-protection um, are far greater than any policies we might implement. So. Yeah, it, it was flawed, it was cruel, and it hasn't even worked. So the mm. tragedy is, of course, they flew her all the way from Georgia back to Texas, had her sit in a room all day, anxiously waiting to be reunited with her daughter. They told her they would, and then came back in, shackled her again, said, we're flying you back to Georgia, because it turns out she's a U.S. citizen. And this decision only applied to undocumented children, undocumented parents. Even more tragic is the fact that then Arizona began parental removal rights proceedings against her. And that means that the foster family would adopt the daughter permanently, remove her parental rights. The only reason, there's no question about whether she's a good parent, legally speaking. The only issue is that she's incarcerated and from a legal standard, you can't be a good parent if you're incarcerated. So that's why they're looking to remove her parental rights. So she came to protect her daughter and now there's the possibility of her permanently, permanently losing her daughter, which is an injustice on top of another injustice and why we've got to get her out. If and I can also just say? interject, like what I realized in you recounting it in this way is that we've what we've done is we've prioritized the terrorism of like immigrants over the protection of a U.S. citizen child. That's right. He's an 11-year-old girl who is a U.S. citizen. Yeah. Can't revoke that. Yeah. You know, but we're but we've placed the importance of her safety and like the nurturing of her as a human being, you know, which can be given uniquely by a mother. We've placed that beneath the priority of of in like striking terror into the hearts of refugees who might want to come right. here. You know, and it's like, yeah. <laughs> so what can people do? Um, Penn, do you want to mention a few things that folks can do to get engaged and help us uh, try to raise awareness to get Vilma out and reunited? The first thing um, that we can do now, I think, is, is sign this petition. Is that right? Because um, we're going to we, hand what, deliver what this able, petition yeah. to ICE. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's the key. And I think I just want to remind people, I don't know if you're following because you're familiar with Tahereh Justice Center's work or maybe you're familiar with, with mine. But um, the efficacy of this petition, I think, is unusual because of all the work the Tahereh Justice Center does and the experience that they have, the expertise that they have, and the fact that they've been on this case now for two months, as I understand, right? Um, and that will continue. So, you know, this isn't just like, the average sign a petition and see what happens. I think this is like, we can actually do quite a lot with relatively little. So so, so that is a, a really, it's an immediate, like very real easy thing um, anyone can do right now. And then the other, um, we definitely want people to be thinking about calling their congressperson. I mean, that's, that is effective when it is done in numbers. And I know that it can feel kind of daunting and sort of obscure and, 
but it, but it is something that is very helpful. Uh, and, I, and I think maybe you can find coaching for uh, what that call would look like on Tahereh's, um site. Is that maybe true? Mm -hmm. am, I, am I overstepping? Yeah, we have materials, but I'll also I'll just make it super simple for people. If you call your congressperson and say, release Vilma, um, we have her full name on our website and on our materials. Um, and pressure your congressperson to pressure Department of Homeland Security and ICE. Um, the calls do matter. Don't email those go into a black hole. It's actually the calls that they uh, count and they monitor, and so that's really helpful. I should mention, of course, and then by the way, we'll take some questions. So um, if you've got some questions, feel free to feed them, and um, Penn and I will, will do our best to answer questions in about two minutes. Um, but I should mention that we are pursuing legal action, obviously. So the Tahereh Justice Center um, we, we are a legal aid organization. We provide free legal defense. When we learned about Vilma's case, uh, unfortunately, it was after she was already denied at the immigration judge level. What happened was that the immigration judge, she went in front of the judge and said, as Penn recalled a bit, I don't speak Spanish and I don't understand this interpreter you've given me. And all my evidence is in a backpack that ICE has in Texas. So I'm not ready, I cannot you know, present my case for asylum. The judge refused to acknowledge or listen to any of that and went ahead and denied her case. So the Tahari Justice Center's Atlanta office is now handling the case on appeal. We're appealing to the Board of Immigration Appeals. We're also appealing into federal court. So all that's gonna continue. Um, but the law right now is being changed. The law right now is harder to navigate and it's providing fewer and fewer protections, particularly to women and girls who are fleeing Central America. And so we need to work not only within the courts, but we need public opinion, we need pressure, we need advocacy on a congressional level and with agencies in order to try to get her out. By the way, her daughter's 12th birthday is on Friday. And so we really, really want to, this is an urgent thing, um, we don't want her to have her birthday without her mother, and it would be an incredible present for her to be reunited by December 21st. So are there questions that, that um, are coming across? Um, are there more people like Vilma who don't fall into the category of families who can be fine? So the question was, are, is Vilma unusual, or are there more women like her? And there are more women like her. I think that, as Penn mentioned, there was a lot of attention to the separation of children and mothers. There was public outcry. There was a decision reported in the press that they should be reunited, and they have not all been reunited. So this isn't over. There's still separation of families and children happening. There was a, there was a uh, there's a woman whose name um, Vilma actually passed me a slip of paper. Oh really? You no. Know, and with her five children that she's not seen, which she's separated from. So that's like what you know. I was there for not more than 10 minutes after she handed me this slip of paper. So it seems like there uh, unfortunately might be a, a well of people in need of the same assistance. Yeah, yeah, and that, that is tragic. Vilma um, Vilma is incarcerated with other mothers like herself. Any other questions? Um, there are women. So women are at a higher risk right now of danger under these new laws, um, in part because, and, and I'll try to not be too lawyerly about this, but the summary is that a case that was decided over 20 years ago, a case that I was lucky to be a part of, helped establish that under the law, you can get asylum or refugee status because of persecution inflicted because of gender. This particular case had to do with forced marriage and female genital mutilation. But then over the years, that was interpreted to apply also to domestic violence, human trafficking, and other kinds of gender-based persecution. Over the summer, unfortunately, there was a decision issued um, that undid, in large part, that decision. And so now, legally, it is harder to seek asylum for women and girls fleeing gender-based persecution. Another quandary under the law is that the immigration courts are not what's called Article III courts under the Constitution. You know, when you went to grade school, you learned about the three branches of government, right? Congress, the executive, and the judiciary. Unfortunately, all the executive courts are under the executive. So the president controls, in fact, all of the immigration courts, 
and influences their decisions, and that's what happened. There was an executive level um, decision to undo that legal precedent. We're litigating now in federal court in order to try to get that into check, but it's legally much more difficult. So maybe one more question, and Penn, if you have any closing thoughts, and then we'll we'll wrap up. Um, one that we're getting a lot. Of. Oh yeah, great. So what else can people do to help? Um, call your Congress person, sign the change.org petition, donate if you can, because we need more resources in order to do that. And those are the things that are most effective right now. And then Penn, a last question is why are you getting involved? Why do you care? And why? what's your relationship with the Tahereh Justice Center? Um, yeah, it's funny. That question is like, in some ways, so broad it's hard to answer, but I know people are interested. Um, well, I think so many, like so many people, I mean, I, I care and I, and I want, I would love to contribute in whatever meaningful way that I can. I definitely don't believe that adding a celebrity to any given cause is necessarily going to help. I think often it might complicate matters and, and, it, and it, I think we've, we find more and more celebrity culture becomes what it is, that it's, that it's actually not just generally helpful. And so I, I really trust the integrity of the Tahara Justice Center, to be honest. Like, I mean, you know, my relationship with Laylee uh, is just naturally, why, you know, the, the reason I'm engaged with this cause is because I trust the integrity of everybody working on this case and that they have tried thus far um, every other avenue. And that if, uh, if this one is then fruitful, then it's like, you know, I know that there's there's a lot of experience and a lot of action um, beyond my engagement that they're going to follow through with. That this is, I mean, you know, their success rate is 99%. I've actually never really encountered an organization with such um, incredible like legitimacy. Uh, so you know, and I'm not saying that like they're not paying me. <laughs> they're, no, they're, we're not. not they don't have the money for that. So like, I, I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just floored by the work that they do and the necessity of it. You know, it's yeah. like right now there are two things in the world I'm thinking about most, and that is racism and and gender-based inequalities. You know, these these are like the two greatest afflictions in the world as far as I can see it. You know, um, they afflict this country as much as any other, if not more. Mm -hmm. This is literally 50% of what I just described right here, gender-based violence. And, and often, of course, the intersections of racism and gender are quite complex, and there and there are so many unique intersections. And, and I find that Tahereh's work with women who are immigrants, it tends to be women of color, right? I mean, if not, maybe across mm -hmm. the board entirely. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is, this is just to me like the most, w w one of, because of my relationship with Laylee, it's just naturally, it's it, because it's organic, I felt like it's fair for a celebrity to get involved in this way because, you know, I'm not just participating in like the sort of most superficial manner, you know, like hosting their galas and really trying to establish a continuous relationship with them so that there's like, you know, who knows? Because this is not going to just stop now. You know, this is not like we, if Vilma was released tomorrow, this is not, this is still an, an issue that's not going away and even if it did it will manifest in other ways as long as we're not collectively thinking about the unity of of humankind and really striving to like just obliterate that aisle that we talk about like reaching across the aisle mm -hmm. and just just like completely do away with partisan politics at least in our actions you know right right no it's not a partisan issue and you know um two things pen that you mentioned first of all our 99 percent success rate. I do want to explain that to people because it, in some ways it sounds odd, but the Tahereh Justice Center has been around for um, 21 years and we have assisted over 25,000 women and girls in that time. We're litigating like right now in this moment, we're litigating around 900 cases. So the volume is relatively high. We, um, When we bring our cases, we do with the full force and weight, not only of Tahereh attorney expertise, but also pro bono attorneys at corporate law firms. We try to um, get resources and uh, attorneys, uh, not just within the organization, but outside the organization to partner. And, and they're, they're big muscles that come to these cases. But, but we do have a 99% success rate, and that is both a reflection of Tahereh's skill, but more importantly, our client's courage. Um, statistically speaking, if you don't have an attorney, you only have a 16% chance of winning, one six. If you have any attorney, it jumps significantly to, to 47%. 
And then, you know, with Tahereh's legal representation, it's quite high. But the thing that breaks my heart is, and we take unwinnable cases. We case, take cases that others have lost. Vilma's case was denied at the lower level. So I also want to make that clear that we pride ourselves on taking really challenging cases. The tragedy is that that's basically a lottery ticket for many people who are mm -hmm. fleeing violence. We are overwhelmed with calls and we can only accept one out of every 10 phone calls we get for help because of lack of capacity. And so it's a tragedy, it's ridiculous, it's unfortunate that we have a system that even requires lawyers. Um, you shouldn't need a lawyer to get justice and that's the real problem. Um, that is a bigger philosophical issue that Vilma's case does reflect, um, but it is, it is an absolute tragedy. And I think um, just to stay on that tangent for one more minute, and I know it's something, Penn, you care a lot about, the role of lawyers, the role of celebrities, the role of um, people with privilege, people who could afford to work for a nonprofit, who were able to get a law degree, all these kinds of things, is also a huge structural problem. Um, Vilma cannot speak. She's voiceless because she is systematically being suppressed, and she is in prison and can't speak for herself. The job of the Tahere Justice Center actually normally is not to speak for our clients and is not to ask actors to speak for our clients, to be honest. Our job is to elevate and amplify the voices of the women we serve, to be silent, to be behind them, and to make sure that they're the ones speaking out. When that doesn't work, then we raise noise and we use whatever means at our disposal. And when that doesn't work, we reach out to friends like Penn who have followers on Instagram and have other mechanisms and tools to help their voice be heard. Um, but we do it begrudgingly. We, we do it knowing that we're in a last resort situation and we do it on behalf of our clients. But in the ideal, it would be our clients who are telling their story first and foremost. And there are other avenues where we deliberately facilitate that on behalf of our clients. So, but this is where we are in Vilma's case and we need to get her out. We need to get her reunited with her daughter and we need your help, everyone's help who might be watching this in order to do it. So again, sign the change.org petition, call your congressperson, tell them to release Vilma and um, spread the word, share, like, uh, and donate if you can. So thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you guys. All right.